Some years ago, mini incision hip arthroplasty became very popular. And some five years ago, I started to carry out hip resurfacing through a mini incision approach. However, I've learned quite a lot over the five years. And I urge you not to move straight to mini incision resurfacing unless you are very experienced at mini incision total hip replacement and have done a substantial number of hip resurfacing procedures through a traditional incision. If you do a mini incision approach for a hip resurfacing and malposition the components, particularly the acetabular component, leaving it open, and if you traumatize the soft tissues, then you have not done the patient a great service. Yeah, before my previous operation, um, I used to play an awful lot of sport. And gradually, the two, three years before I had the operation, obviously I had to cut down the sport completely. Uh, I had quite a lot of pain before the previous operation too, and I had a definite limp. Um, since the operation, well, the limp, limp went straight away and the pain went straight away. Uh, six months later, I found myself being able to play some light tennis quite comfortably. Uh, even, even jog a little, nine, nine to twelve months. No problem keeping up with my youngest child, running around. The other activity I like doing, was able to do after the other one, is I do a lot of trekking in the deserts. And that's quite hard work. And before I had the other operation, I used to get a lot of pain going to sleep at night. Uh, now, now um, I don't get any pain at all in that, in that hip, none whatsoever. So this is a 51-year-old man who's otherwise fit and well. He's had a very successful right hip resurfacing five years, nine months uh, ago. And now his left hip has become arthritic and in need of surgical treatment. This is the x-ray before his uh, right hip resurfacing and you can see that he's lost his superior joint space on the right side and he's got a lot of medial uh, osteophyte buildup in the acetabulum and on the femoral head. At that stage the left hip was arthritic but he still had some superior joint space left. This is the x-ray now uh, showing his right resurfaced hip five years nine months later. He uh, has no femoral neck thinning, the components are in good alignment and there's no evidence of any loosening of the right hip resurfacing. Now he's got severe arthritic change on the left hip. A close-up x-ray of the left hip shows uh, that severe arthritic change with loss of superior joint space, a lot of uh, acetabular floor osteophyte which we shall have to get out and some uh, osteophyte formation on his medial femoral neck. Here we can see templates both on the femur and the acetabulum. On the right side is the acetabular component seated in a perfect position. We've removed the medial osteophyte in the acetabular floor and uh, position the acetabular component in about 40 degrees of inclination. On the femoral side you can see the alignment we want to achieve. That 54 millimeter femoral component clears the femoral neck. Uh, we have sighted the component symmetrically on the femoral neck with slight valgus alignment and we've uh, templated and measured uh, the distance from the long axis of the femoral component to the tip of the lesser tro trochanter and that measures 4.3 centimeters. So here we are all set up for uh, surgery. We're operating in a uh, ultra clean air vertical downflow uh, enclosure. All the team have uh, body exhaust suits. In addition, I've got a Charnley hood on. We sent this operation live by satellite to the United States for teaching. And uh, we're going to speed the operation up for you from about one hour to 45 minutes. So I've marked for you the tip and the posterior aspect of the greater trochanter. And I've marked a traditional posterior lateral incision. That's a mini posterior incision. Over the past five years, I've gone to mini incisions, but I've got uh, over my 
very mini incision approach uh, resurfacings and now we're operating at about 12 to 15 centimeters incision length whereas a few years ago I was doing it 7 to 10 uh, centimeters incision length we're identifying the uh, fascia lata here and uh, stripping off some fat and then we're going to uh, coagulate uh, vessels uh, in the fat layer. I find that uh, oozing into the fat layer is uh, the most troublesome area uh, I have after hip surgery and I try and obtain good hemostasis in that uh, fat layer. If you're going to do a shortened uh, posterior approach it's important not to try and do it through a smaller posterior lateral skin incision. If you're going to go shorter with the incision then you need to go more posterior also with the incision. Now here I'm uh, cutting into the fascia lata and we want to cut two or three centimeters into the fascia lata. That's not necessary for a total hip replacement but with resurfacing you want to get a good uh, view of the lesser trochanter and uh, that little bit of incision into the fascia lata uh, really does help uh, in exposing the, uh, the lesser trochanter. I'm staying outside the uh, greater trochanter bursa because I'm going to incise and repair the greater trochanter bursa later. It's important of course not to injure the sciatic nerve and if there's doubt you can palpate or indeed expose the sciatic nerve to make sure that no injury to it occurs. It's also important not to split too far proximally the fibers of gluteus uh, maximus because injury to the inferior gluteal nerves will cause atrophy and an ugly cosmetic dip in the buttock musculature. I'm now separating uh, under the anterior limb of the incision from the uh, greater trochanter bursa, the undersurface of the uh, gluteus maximus muscle. Put in a Charnley retractor and just to give you an idea of incision length, because it's difficult on video, I can about get my fist into that incision. So that's quite comfortable and adequate to do a hip resurfacing through. Of course you can do it through a much smaller incision, but it's harder work. I'm now dividing the gluteal sling or the tendon of gluteus maximus. Um, now I'm cutting the greater trochanter bursa over the external rotator muscles and coagulating any bleeding vessels. I'm now carrying that cutting of the greater trochanter bursa proximally, again coagulating vessels and the object here is to expose the posterior aspect of the abductors and the external rotators so that we can see them very clearly. Now we're putting a retractor under the posterior edge of gluteus medius and I'm wanting to identify the gap between piriformis muscle and the back edge of gluteus minimus and I've opened that up with coagulation. Now I'm going under the uh, gluteus minimus muscle and I'm cutting the connecting fibers between the undersurface of minimus and the capsule and acetabulum and that mobilizes the abductors and prevents them tearing. Now I'm going to put a retractor pin into the ileum and that will retract forwards the abductor muscles. It's important to identify piriformis and make sure that it's not the obturator internus. So we're cutting piriformis and the capsule all in one layer and now I'm going to cut the rest of the external rotators and I'm going to be careful to leave a cuff attached to the back of the femur for repair later.